敵の衛星兵の制服だよく覚えとけこいつらを狙え How did the Japanese view medics? And did the Japanese purposely shoot medics? This is something Japanese soldiers were encouraged to do, along with targeting officers, and radio men especially. Propaganda played a large role in this. Japanese propaganda and indoctrination from a young age defined the Japanese soldier as one who fought for their country, their family, their honor, and for a higher power. On the other hand, Japanese propaganda painted American and allied soldiers as individually driven, greedy, and cowardly. They believe that America's superior advantage and resources could be overcome by breaking America's weak spirit or will to fight. One such strategy to break American spirit was to target medics, which in theory would damage morale on the battlefield. The white's a bullseye. Here, I got you a new helmet. Shooting medics during World War II was indeed illegal, according to Chapter 4, Article 25 of the Geneva Convention assuming they were carrying out their medical duties and not actively using a weapon, and many did carry carbines or pistols. Now, Japan did sign the Geneva Convention in 1929, but failed to ratify it. Rather, Japan's government in 1942 simply stated it would respect the rules, so shooting medics was not technically breaking Japanese or treaty law. Japanese soldiers did not have to fear any form of punishment from their own justice system for doing this. Oh my god, no! In fact, the idea of a soldier being punished for shooting a medic would seem absurd compared to larger atrocities against medical staff, hospitals, and medical ships that took place during the war. For example, in February of 1942 at the Alexander Hospital in Singapore, Japanese soldiers massacred between 150 and 200 staff and patients. In China, crimes were far worse. Just as shown in the movies, it did not take long for American medics to purposely choose not to wear their Red Cross in battle against the Japanese. So why did the Japanese seemingly have no respect for the Red Cross or treatment of the wounded? Well, it's not completely black and white. Japan became a military dictatorship in the 1930s. This involved a resurgence in nationalism and a revival of the tradition of Bushido, a moral code dating back to the times of the samurai, dictating how a warrior should think and behave. Self-sacrifice or giving oneself to the state or cause is central to this warrior code. The Japanese believed being captured or even disengaging from a fight due to injury was dishonorable. <laughs> Many fanatics believe that a man who was hiding behind an injury, or particularly surrendering, was beneath contempt. It wasn't unheard of, for example, for men who could not be patched up and returned to the fight to commit suicide rather than be captured in their injured or defenseless state. One doctor, Dr. Paul Tatsuguchi, trained in California in the 1930s, fighting at the Battle of Attu, chronicled his experience serving as a medical officer for the Imperial Army. An excerpt from his last journal entry. The last assault is to be carried out. All the patients in the hospital were made to commit suicide. Only 33 years of living, and I am to die. Took care of all the patients with grenades. Goodbye, Tycho, my beloved wife, who loved me to the last. However, acts like these were not completely in line with early 20th century Japanese culture. Japan in the 20th century had fairly modern medical practices, largely modeled after German medicine, and though like the Germans they lacked some medicine like penicillin and relied on less effective sulfinamides for infection, they typically had the same medical technology as in the West. Japan in fact during the Russo-Japanese War had the largest Red Cross society in the world, with over a million members. They were even internationally praised for their treatment of Russian prisoners of war during this time. Japan even collected $146,000 for American relief efforts after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. In World War I, Japan, an ally, sent medical workers to Europe. During World War II, however, the military dictatorship suppressed these humanitarian values and greatly restricted the Japanese Red Cross from assisting anyone outside of Japan. Red Cross or other medical aid rarely made it to Allied prisoners of war, but there were exceptions. One myth is that the Japanese themselves did not have medics, but they did, and their equipment was often labeled with the Red Cross. An army cannot function without medicine. In warfare, particularly jungle warfare, more soldiers can be lost to disease and infection than actual battle. 
Medics were valued for keeping the Japanese army in the fight, on land or at sea. Despite having medics and medical staff that were similarly trained to their allied counterparts, injured Japanese soldiers still rarely surrendered. It was common for Japanese officers to switch tactics and propaganda when they knew they would be fighting to the death. Facing death, they might further reinforce their soldiers not to surrender, claiming they were now fighting not the average soft and weak American soldier, but rather marines, recruited from jails or insane asylums, with a bloodlust. To be captured would mean only brutal torture, followed by certain death. A special force recruited from jails and insane asylums for bloodlust. <laughs> the Japanese military also experimented with stimulants to amplify the fighting spirit. This included experimentation with methamphetamine, but there is much debate about the extent of this. Stimulants were said to sometimes be mixed with tea before an attack, and more commonly used by pilots. Stockpiles of such drugs, combined with the traumas of war, are thought to be a major contributing factor to a drug epidemic in post-war Japan. The Japanese, like the Allies, also had spiritual support to accompany their armies. The Japanese had both Buddhist and Shinto leaders attached to Imperial Army regiments. The Japanese government actively sought to increase the presence of Japanese religion in foreign lands, to wash away Christianity, and to also spread Japanese influence by religious means. Shinto and Buddhist leaders further sought to encourage sacrifice and bravery amongst Japanese soldiers. Japanese Shintoism and nationalist branches of Buddhism greatly encouraged placing the good of the community or nation ahead of individualism. Many might associate Buddhism as a religion of peace, but that's not always the case. Japan, even prior to the 1930s, had uncompromising Buddhist nationalist groups which espoused war and aggressive religious expansion. Many monks were eager to join the war effort. Much like the Red Cross, less nationalist and more peaceful branches of Buddhism in Japan were suppressed. Buddhist branches with greater Chinese roots over Japanese Buddhist traditions also face suppression from the government. Ultimately, Japan in the final months of the war lost as many medics as they did soldiers to suicide attacks or doomed defensive actions. At Okinawa, Hime Yuri are one example of how desperate the Japanese were to fill medical roles at the end of the war. Hime Yuri were high school students as young as 15 who filled in for battlefield nurses and medical staff. 222 students and 18 teachers with limited training were briefed they were to aid Red Cross hospitals away from the fighting. Instead, they were positioned on the front lines in caves and dugouts, involved in operations including amputations. The majority of them would not survive. Many were killed by both American and Japanese crossfire, but also many committed suicide, believing they would suffer a grisly fate at the hands of American soldiers. As for the Japanese soldiers who shot medics, almost none were brought to justice, at least within a court. It was near impossible to locate or identify living Japanese soldiers who committed these acts. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this overview on the Japanese perspective of medics in World War II. I know I went a bit off topic in this one, but hopefully it was interesting nonetheless. As always, when discussing topics of war crimes, I do expect a lot of well, what about when America did this, or that, etc.? A reminder, you can discuss war crimes independently without whataboutisms. There is, of course, room for comparison, but the advantage of independently discussing a topic is that it can be more easily done so without minimalization or bias.